1930, 1931, there was a German officer who graduated from the U.S. Infantry School at Fort Benning, Georgia. He had been sent there by his government. And this officer, this uh, Adolf, Captain Adolf von Schell, had served in the First World War as an infantry commander at the, uh, the platoon and the company level. And he was uh, a very, very experienced commander. He saw action on both the Western and the Eastern Front during the First World War. And he had a great deal of experience. And after the war, in the 1920s and 1930s, he continued his service with the greatly reduced in size uh, German army of that era. And he was actually selected to go to study in the United States. And he gave a series of lectures while he was in the United States to other military officers of the U.S. Army. And these lectures were later collected into a book which came to be titled Battle Leadership. Battle Leadership by Captain Adolf von Schell. This is a very interesting book. It was actually on the, um, the required reading list for Marine officers when I, was in, uh, when I was on active duty back in the early 1990s. And um, it's re it achieved very, very, very high praise. It may still be a required reading book. I don't, I don't know if it is or not. I haven't checked recently, but um, very interesting book. And I wanted to read some of the relevant anecdotes and passages in this book because I think it will help people put certain things into perspective and help to enable people to think about certain things. So I'm going to do that. So I'll begin now. We who have been in war know that the hardest thing we have had to do was to lie quietly under hostile fire and wait for an attack. Why? When a soldier lies under hostile fire and waits, he feels unable to protect himself. He has time, he thinks, he only waits for the shot that will hit him. He feels a certain inferiority to the enemy. He feels that he is alone and deserted. I remember one day in 1916 in Russia, during the night we had relieved the Austrians. On the following morning, the Russians began a heavy artillery preparation. We were unfamiliar with the terrain. We had no idea what troops were on our right and left. We did not know what artillery we had. I was alone with my company in the midst of an Austrian battalion. I did not know my superiors. The Russians had been firing for hours, but our artillery didn't reply. I went constantly from dugout to dugout to see and speak to my men. They should at least see that they were not alone. Repeatedly they had asked me, are we really entirely alone here? Haven't we any artillery? It continued this way for hours. Our telephone wires had been shot to pieces and finally a tremendous noise came from the rear. Our own artillery was firing. At once high spirits returned these soldiers no longer felt deserted. Each could see and hear that our side was now doing something. Each saw that he was being supported and that everyone was ready to repulse the attack. In great defensive battles, one will constantly hear the remark when the enemy, enemy artillery is firing, where is our own artillery? It was the same with our aviators. If a hostile flyer was over us for merely 10 minutes, the soldiers would begin to question, haven't we any flyers? Where are our flyers? If our anti-aircraft guns began to shoot at the hostile aviator, the soldier was at once satisfied. He saw that something was being done. It is different during the attack. Here the soldier himself acts. He has something to do. He moves forward. He fires. He assaults and dictates the action of the enemy. At the moment of the attack, he never asks, where is our artillery? From the beginning of the attack, he feels himself the victor. He storms forward. He believes he can do everything by himself. He needs no support. As soon as the attack slows down, the cry for artillery is heard again. In the Carpathian Mountains in February 1917, my company was in a position on top of a high mountain that dominated the terrain in all directions. In places, the Romanians were only 20 meters away. One day, we were surprised by an enemy attack and pressed back to the edge of the mountaintop. A hard hand-to-hand -hand fight with bayonets and hand grenades ensued. 
At the end of an hour's fight, we finally succeeded in pushing the Romanians down the mountain. At the very, at the very beginning of the fight, I had seen the artillery observer, who had been in my trench, fall. From that time on, I felt that my company and I were fighting alone without artillery support. In consequence, I called our regional, regimental adjutant on the telephone and complained that the artillery had not helped us. The battery commander, concerned, came to me soon afterwards and told me that his battery had fired about 300 rounds in my support during the fighting, that is, about five rounds every minute. I had not heard a single one of them. We had fought, acted, and in the excitement of the fighting, I had not noticed that our own artillery was firing. This desire to act is, in my opinion, the reason why soldiers go out willingly on patrol. I repeat that it is extremely difficult to lie in hostile fire and wait, because one feels exposed to blind chance. But on patrol it is different. The soldier feels that his destiny rests in his own hands. He feels that he is not dependent on blind fate, that he is not forced to go this way or that, but can decide himself what to do. He feels that he controls the situation. For example, he may think, that path over the hill seems dangerous to me. I don't know why, but I have that feeling most definitely. Therefore, I prefer to go through the valley. He has the feeling that his action depends on his own will, and in consequence, he can act in accordance with that will. Here are two examples which show that this sense of security is a decisive factor. It is not a question whether security is actually existent. In September 1914, we were on a hill near Berry au Bac, near the Chemin de Dames. At our immediate right, a road and a canal led down to Berry au Bac, which was occupied by the French. A small stone house stood on this road. I had placed a picket of five or six men in this house to guard the road. One day I happened to be there when the French suddenly opened fire on the house with heavy artillery. A shell landed every minute. Everyone knows that single shells are far more unpleasant than a barrage because there, is, there, because there is time to wait and think things out. The first shell fell about 50 meters short, the second about 100 meters long. The third was again short, the next one hit close to the house. I noticed that my men were uneasy. They were now waiting for the shell they could they were now waiting for the shell that would fall in the middle of the house. I couldn't leave my men at this time, although my place was really not there. So we waited together. This waiting and this uncertainty made us nervous. We sat in the house and listened for every shell. We could tell exactly whether it was too short or too long, whether it would fall to our right or to our left. Finally, the following thought came to me. The walls of this house are very thick, in fact, about a yard thick. If a shell bursts outside the house and we are in it, nothing can happen to us. If, however, a shell bursts in the house, then it would be better to be outside. Therefore, the best thing to do is to sit in the door and watch the shells. We can tell where they are going, and we will be in a position to go either into the house or out of it. So I sat down on a chair in the door and was soon perfectly satisfied, so satisfied, in fact, that I soon went to sleep. This action on my part calmed my men to such an extent that they began to play cards. After a few hours, the firing ceased. Now you may laugh at my action in this case. I am too ready to laugh at it myself. My conviction at that time was nonsense. One cannot decide whether a shell will land three or four yards to the right or to the left. I have only mentioned the point to illustrate that it makes no difference whether or not the security is real. It is simply a question of feeling that it is. Still another example. It was August 1916. The great Russian offensive under General Brusilov had thrown the Austrians far to the rear. We were brought up by rail and then moved to the front in rapid marches to assist the Austrians. For several days we bivouacked in a forest behind our artillery. Then one night we moved up close to the front as a reserve and our companies were scattered all over the terrain. As we were unfamiliar with the sector, an Austrian non-commissioned officer conducted our company to the front. We were halted under a large shed. We were happy to have a roof over our heads and slept soundly until morning. When dawn broke, I saw that this shed was entirely in the open and not more than 200 meters from an Austrian battery. 
This placed us in such a position that, if the Russians began firing at this battery, we would be right in the middle of their concentration. Furthermore, I could not see a Russian balloon. Furthermore, I could see a Russian balloon. Therefore, we could not move out of our shed. My fears were soon confirmed. The Russians opened upon the Austrian battery with heavy artillery. One out of every three or four shots fell short, bursting close to the, into the shed in which my company was sheltered. Until night fell, while the Russian balloon went down, we could not move. The shells continued to fall all around our shed. No one said a word. I noticed that my men were slightly nervous. Several came to me and asked permission to go outside, giving more or less trivial excuses. I refused, for it was apparent that they only wanted to reach a place of safety. The nervous excitement became very tense. Suddenly a shell came down right in the middle of the company, but it failed to burst. Nerves were frayed almost to the breaking point. We were like a kettle, which would soon boil over. In order to obtain a feeling of security, someone had to act. Then I had a good thought. I called the company barber, sat down with my back to the front, and told him to cut my hair. I must say that in my whole life no haircut has ever been so unpleasant. Every time a shell whistled over our heads, I jerked my head down and the barber would tear out a few hairs instead of cutting them. But the effect was splendid. The soldiers evidently felt that if the company commander could sit quietly and let his hair be cut, that the situation was not so bad, and that they were probably safer than they thought. Conversation began, a few jokes were said, several men began to play cards, someone began to sing, no one paid any more attention to the shells, even though two men were wounded a few minutes later by a shell which struck in the vicinity. Two points stand out in this incident. Number one, instill a sense of security in the men. By so doing, you will help them overcome their fears. Number two, do something to induce action among them. If they have been on the defensive for a long time, send out patrols, even if there is no special reason for patrols. Patrolling instills a sense of self-confidence and superiority. I served for a long time under, regiment, under a regimental commander who demanded that, it, that one patrol be sent out from each company every night. Each patrol was required to bring back clear-cut evidence of its activity, such as a prisoner or a piece of hostile wire. Soon there was a regular competition among the companies. Everyone wanted to go out on patrol. In the German army, we used we used in the, in the German army we use what we term mission tactics. That is, orders are not written out in the minutest detail. A mission is merely given to the commander. How it shall be carried out is his problem. This is done because the commander on the ground is the only one who can correctly judge existing existing conditions and take the proper action if a change occurs in the situation. There is also a strong psychological reason for these mission tactics. The commander, who can make his own decisions within the limits of his mission, feels that he is responsible for what he does. Consequently, he will accomplish more because he will act in accordance with his own psychological individuality. Give this same independence to your platoon and squad leaders. It is certainly evident from training in peace that the more freedom allowed a subordinate leader in his training, the better the result will be. Why? Because he is made responsible for results and allowed to achieve them in his own way. So that's the that's uh, that's the selection I'm reading from Captain uh, von Schell's memoirs, Battle Leadership, and there are many many good lessons in that passage. I don't need to restate them for you; you've just heard them. But many of those lessons touch upon things that we've already talked about here in this podcast in the past: being responsible, taking action, understanding that you alone are responsible for what you do. And the idea that sometimes you have to just do something. It doesn't matter what. You have to take action. Even if only to calm your own nerves and the nerves of those around you. Don't be a fear monger. Don't be a, don't be a panic monger. Don't be a whiner. Don't be a complainer, complainer. Do something. And remember always that you alone are responsible. Mission tactics, mission orders work because... They take into account these psychological factors. When someone is given a task to do, 
When someone is given a task to do, they will use their own initiative. They will use their own problem-solving capabilities to carry out that task. If you try to micromanage people, if you try to laboriously dictate every single dimension of their actions, all you will create is a dead mechanism. All you will create is a dead mechanism. Tell subordinates how to do things, supervise them, but don't interfere with how they carry it out. That's just one of the many lessons. I think the major lesson in this passage that I just read is sometimes it does more good to show courage, calmness, and coolness in a crisis situation than it is to simply run around like a chicken with one's head cut off, stressing, fretting, and not inspiring confidence. This is the message. This is the message. So get out there, internalize these things, and make it happen.